thank you so very much. My sister, my spouse, I, I pray the Lord's blessing on you. Let's go directly to the word. Um, we're, we're reading our text tonight uh, from the book of Jude, the second to last book in the Bible, just before Revelation. The book of Jude, Jude 1, we're reading verse 1, and then we're reading verses 5 through 15. Here, here beginneth the reading of God's word. Jude, a servant of Jesus, Jesus Christ, and a brother of James, to whose, to those who have been called, those who are loved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Though you already know this, he says, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. I want you to hear that. He delivered them out of Egypt, but that later destroyed those who did not believe. The second verse, or verse six rather, he says, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. Verse seven, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversions. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Verse 8. In the same way, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these are ungodly people, polluted their own bodies, they reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. Verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. Verse 10. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And they very things that they do not understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Verse 11, he writes, woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Verse 12, these people are blemishes at your love fest. I love that, your love feast. Eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves and not their sheep. They are clouds without rain, blowing along by the wind. Uh, they are autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Verse 13, they are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for who, whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. And verse 14 is the where I, where I wanted to get to. Enoch, the seventh man from Adam, he prophesied about them, writing, See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Verse 15, to judge everyone and to convict all of them, all of them of their ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words, listen to that, the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So far, that's the scripture. And my, my title, my subject tonight is Enoch's Prophecy. The Emperor Strikes Back. The Emperor Strikes Back. Not the Empire Strikes Back. I know many of you are Star Wars uh, aficionados. Uh, but I, I borrowed from that because I feel like it's 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 a it's a comparison that I'd like to make. So in this message, this teaching, I'm not going to be talking about Star Wars characters like like Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Princess Leia and Darth Vader and Chewbacca and Yoda nor R2D2. Instead, I'm going to be speaking about the real empire, the real kingdom of God, the the real emperor, whose name is Jesus. So if you remember in the movie, The Empire Strikes Back. The hero, Han Solo, his left uh, frozen, carbon frozen indeed, uh, and, he, and he was in need of rescue. 
But when this emperor strikes back, the world will have struck out and the hero will be in no need of rescue. The next time Jesus comes will be the last time he comes. He will not come in a stable like before. He will come to a crown. He will not die on a tree like before. He will sit on a throne. He will not stand before Pilate. Pilate will kneel before him. He will not be rejected by the nations and especially the nation of Israel. The Bible tells us that he will be received by the nation of Israel and all Israel will be saved. When we read this, we realize that the apostle Jude, quoting an Old Testament preacher by the name of Enoch, this reveals much about the time when the emperor will strike back and when Jesus will come again. So we discover that Enoch is the very first preacher of the second coming of Jesus. Now, I know that we've had other uh, prophecies by Isaiah and others. But Enoch is the first preacher of the second coming. Amen. Now, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jude reveals something that we, we would not know about otherwise. What is it you ask? He tells us that the first man ever to predict the second coming of Jesus Christ was, in fact, Enoch. Here's what the Bible says in, in verse 14 of our text. Now, Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, behold, the Lord comes. Notice, other than a couple of mentions of his name in the Bible, the book really talks very little about Enoch. But when it does speak about Enoch, it reveals a great deal. We only read about Enoch, I think, three times in the Bible. Once in Genesis, once in Hebrews, and here in the book of Jude. In Genesis, we are told that Enoch had a personal walk with God, Genesis 5.22. It simply says, Enoch walked with God. That's enough for me, right? That, that caused me to say, okay, what else do we know, know about Enoch? And then I, I flip to Hebrews 11.5. The book tells us that Enoch's worship of God was pleasing to God. The Bible says, by faith, Enoch was translated. So watch this. He did not even see death and was not found. He was not found because God had translated him. And of course, that's intriguing to anybody. And then it goes on to say, for be, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Lord, help me. I, I want for the testimony of Don Dixon to be that he pleased God. I really do. And I hope that is your, your prayer as well. Uh, here in the book of Jude, we are told that Enoch gave a powerful witness for God. It is important to point out that Enoch was not some, some major prophet of the Bible, like, like, like Abraham or uh, like Isaiah. He was, he was not a magnetic personality like Moses, right? And he was not a master politician like, say, Joseph but he was a mighty preacher of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was the first one. His name, Enoch, means dedicated. Enoch walked with God and got a word from God and gave a witness of God that the Lord Jesus is coming again. I find it personally amazing that Enoch prophesied the second coming of Jesus. And I never even saw the first coming of Jesus in his prophecies. I don't believe it was accidental or coincidental that Enoch was the first preacher of the second coming. And I know I'm harping on this, but it just hit me kind of hard. I don't think very many people recognize this. He, he should have been because he didn't die. The Bible says he was raptured. Enoch didn't walk through the valley of the shadow of death like many, many other uh, biblical people did, right? Uh, Genesis 5, 24 reveals that, and Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. And when you read that, you go, whoa, that's dope. It must be that, 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 that Enoch got close to God's house, right? And, and the Lord was like, we're closer to my house now, so let's just go to my house, right? That's how I think about it. At least that's how I've heard it represented before. 
Enoch represents the last Christian generation that is not going to be delivered from death. We will be raptured out of here. You could say in one sense that he, he was a one-trick pony. This is all he preached. This is all he knew about. This is what God gave him. And it was his whole message. The Bible reveals the rapture talked more about in greater detail in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 16 and 17, right? It's kind of God's outline in summary. If you read those couple of verses, and I usually only uh, deal with these verses in detail when I'm doing like a funeral, right? And, and we talk about the end time. So in these couple of verses, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Bible says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. This first piece, uh, this first glimpse of the return of our Savior deals with his return, his second return, his second coming, if you will. The next portion of that verse deals with the resurrection of the saved, right? And the dead in Christ shall rise first, the resurrection of the saved. And the third portion of this verse, verse 17 now, deals with the rapture of the saints. So the return of the creator, the resurrection of the saved, and the rapture of the saint. Follow me now. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. I, 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 I have this discussion going on with my, my other Bible study group, my little realtors, my, my group of realtors, and they can't get this because where they come from, what they have been taught uh, is that um, when you die, you go straight to heaven. And, and I have to always remind them that, you know, the Lord's not coming down here on earth and walk the earth like he did the first time around. We're going to meet him in the cloud. What does that require? It means that you need to have the Holy Spirit in your heart, right? And I go through a whole discussion about you can't live for God without God. And, and it is the Holy Spirit that is going to cause us to be raptured. And, and they, they, of course, look at me strange, and we have another 10-minute discussion about that. But it's, 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 for, it's verses like this, like these, if you will, um, that cause me to think about that and think about it seriously. I don't know to what extent Enoch understood this whole series of verses and this whole prophecy, uh, not, not the second and the third part, certainly, but he understood the first part, and that's what he preached. The Lord is coming back. And here again, we are, we are listening to Enoch, not only because of who he was, but remember, you may not know this, but when Enoch lived, is also curious. It's an important detail that we often miss. Uh, he lived thousands of years ago, but the day in which he lived is not very different from the day in which we are living now. How do I know this? Uh, well, I have you know that the Bible tells us that Enoch lived in the same day as Noah. Think about that. Right before the flood. Remember what Jesus said about those days? It was a picture of his day, of the last days. Let me read it for you, Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will it be with the Son of Man returns. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the son of man be Matthew 24 37 to 39 so so brother Enoch was not only a prophet for his day he was also a prophet for our day as well because there were basically three characteristics that marked his day and they, they also mark our day and I'll try to go through these quickly number one his day was marked by disobedience Genesis 6 11 tells us the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Violence was a hallmark of the day in which 
he lived, and it is also a day, a, a hallmark of the day in which we live. Today, the police are outmanned and outgunned, if you will, right? Violence uh, is a hallmark of our day. Not very long ago, I remember this because I, uh, I remember watching it intently on TV with like you know, bewilderment, uh, a, bank, a bank robbery. Two bank robbers botched this robbery in California. They came out of the bank, AK-47s are blazing. Uh, they were covered from head to toe with body armor and from the neck all the way down to their feet. And the police nine millimeter bullets were just bouncing off of them. If you all remember this, I have an image in my mind because I was watching it on TV going, wow. Right. It took over an hour. To, to subdue these guys, seven wounded policemen, three wounded civilians before. So someone finally shot him in the head and killed him. In our modern society, if a court verdict doesn't go in your favor, we have violence. If our political party doesn't win, we have violence. If a team wins or lose the world championship in any sport, in many cities, we have violence. So without a doubt, our day is a day of disobedience and violence. My goodness, just last Saturday, former president of the United States was giving a, a speech in broad daylight, somebody tried to kill him. <laughs> it is a fact that we are living in a day of violence. A day of violence. This is exactly what was happening right before the flood. And remember what the flood was. It was a judgment of violence. Are y'all following me? Yeah. Genesis 6, 5 says it was also a day of disbelief. The Bible says, quote, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Hebrew word here for intent literally means to make something as a potter would fashion a vessel from clay. In other words, we're not just talking about these people daydreaming about evil. We're talking about they carefully craft ungodly philosophies and ideologies, and then they craft it and squeeze the world into their ungodly mode of thinking. So today, we have resorted to calling each other with names of mistrust. And if you're not, you know, these are just examples. If you're not pro-choice, then you're narrow-minded and you're a chauvinist. If you do not support the homosexual ideology and agenda, then you're homophobic and you're intolerant. If you're not a feminist, then you're politically incorrect. If you're not multicultural in your ideology, you're a bigot, right? Genesis 6 and 3 reveals that the Lord said, quote, my spirit is not going to strive with y'all forever, right? And in stitching these ideals together, these ideas together, I see that this is also an age of disregard. The Bible says even in those days, terrible days, mankind was being given a fair warning by the Holy Spirit of God through the preaching of men like Noah and Enoch. The Bible tells us that Noah preached 120 years. Y'all know that? Now, of course, homie lived to like 950, but 120 of those years, he was preaching, y'all better be careful because the Lord's going to judge the earth. And the Spirit of God was trying to convince, to convict, and to convert them. But they simply didn't care. Jesus said they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. So when it came to spiritual matters, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, even the wrath of God, there was apathy. I don't really care about all that. If you talk to people about God and they were like, I don't know, man, I don't really care about all that. I mean, there's a great lesson we can learn here about the day and age in which we live and compare that to the day that Enoch lived. Whenever a nation falls into spiritual apathy, such as that was with uh, Enoch's day, Noah's day, they will also fall into social apathy. And when people get to a point where they don't care about 
the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, they won't care about a whole bunch of other things like character, honesty, love thy neighbor. And this is a problem for the Lord because in going down that list, there's a violation of, of many of God's laws, rules, guidance for us, which I'm sure the Lord is not happy about. So that's the first big chunk that I wanted to kind of lay the foundation. Now, there was this next phase of the factual promise of the second coming that Enoch gave us in his message. He said, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints, verse 14, in our text. And in the Greek language, the verb comes is in the past tense. I want you to listen to this. What it literally means, if you were to kind of dissect it, it says, behold, the Lord came, it's in the past tense, with 10,000s of his saints. Came is in the past tense, not come, right? And in the Greek language, that is called the prophetic past. You study this in Bible school. Oftentimes, the Greeks would state a future event using uh, phrases in the past tense, right? To show that something was guaranteed to happen, right? You see, I think a lot of things in, in this kind of prophecy, in God's mind, the second coming of Jesus is a done deal, right? It's a done deal. So in, in, in some of the language, it is referred to as past tense. So in God's mind, it's already done. Revelation 13, 8 tells us, listen to this, that Jesus is the lamb slain, past tense, from the foundation of the world. See what I mean? Before the world even saw or knew that there was a cross, God saw Calvary. Jesus crucified in the mind of God before there were ever Romans and evil men to crucify him on Calvary's cross. And God did something unique for Enoch's thousands of years ago. He drew back the curtain of time, gave Enoch a sneak preview of what was coming, sort of like coming attractions, like you see on TV or in the movies. And he said, Enoch, I wanted you to preach what is going to happen, but it has not yet happened. I want you to preach what is going to happen, but it has not yet happened. Which the world believes will never happen, but it is as if it's already happened. And may I say to you that there are two things that neither time, money, power, or government cannot change what has already happened in the past. And may I submit to you also what God says is going to happen in the future. In fact, as strange as it may sound, you can be sure of what God says will happen tomorrow, more so than what you can expect to happen today. Now, the question may be raised, well, if his coming is so sure, where is he then? Well, the first preacher of the second coming gives us a clue. If you remember the genealogy in Genesis 5, uh, Genesis 5, 21, when the Bible says Enoch was 65 years old when he became the father, watch this, of Methuselah. I use Methuselah a lot because I like to say it. Now, the name Methuselah is very fascinating. If you look it up, it literally means when he is dead, follow me now, it shall come. What was the it? What was it? It shall come. It was referring to the flood of Noah's day. Stay with me. Methuselah, in a sense, was God's watch, God's timer. And when he died, God's judgment was going to come. When Methuselah died, the flood did come. The reason that is so interesting is because Methuselah was the oldest man to ever live, having lived 969 years, Genesis 5.27. And why was he the oldest man who ever lived? I think that he represented something. 
he represented God's long suffering, God's patience, God's mercy. Uh, God gave this world almost a thousand years to repent. Are you all hearing me? To get right with him before he said the flood, the judgment of the flood. And so you see the second coming of Jesus is also a promise. It is a fact that as far as God is concerned, it's a done deal. It's already happened. Remember 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us war, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's waiting. Before the flood, he gave them 969 years. Now, of course, God's timing and our timing, you can debate that. Uh, but that's a long time. And then Noah preached for 120 years. By the way, if, if, if any of you get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., go to the U.S. Capitol and, and go to the dome. Go to the dome and look up. And there you will see inscribed in the dome of the U.S. Capitol are these words. One God, one law, one element, and one divine far-off event toward which all creation moves. Isn't that crazy? I love that. Our founding fathers of these United States were so convinced of Jesus's return that they inscribed it in the Capitol building. And so we had better be ready for the return of the Lord. It's not that we have not been warned. Enoch goes on to prophesy something else about the second coming. That is, one of the major reasons for it is to execute judgment on all who convict, on all of them. He's trying to convert. He calls them ungodly, ungodly men, right? With their ungodly deeds, they have committed an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, verse 15 in our text. Good is going to triumph above evil. We know that. Right is going to triumph over wrong. Truth is going to triumph over lies. Light is going to triumph over darkness. And it is interesting that the first prophecy ever given through a man concerning the second coming of Jesus is judgment. Are you all hearing me? I know this kind of preaching doesn't uh, doesn't happen very often, but I want us to know, at least my little group here, judgment is coming. It is also interesting that the last prophecy in the Bible also concerns the second coming of Jesus, and that too is about judgment. Mm. Mm. You notice, after the warning, the world never add never take away from the word of God. And Jesus said, surely I am coming quickly. You see, the second coming of Jesus not only means joy for the saints, it means judgment for the sinners. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul uh, said, the time is coming when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes and in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. That's in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10. In other words, when the Lord Jesus returns, the saints will be purified, sinners are going to be horrified, and the Savior will be glorified. Uh, Jude specifically says that Jesus is coming back to execute judgment and to convict all who are ungodly. Uh, the word convict here, as many of you will, will attest, is a legal term used in a courtroom, so to speak. Uh, it speaks of a just verdict that is reached 
and a just sentence that is passed after the conviction. And every guilty sinner will be confronted, convicted, and condemned without argument. You see, for, for the ungodly, Jesus is both the prosecuting attorney and the judge. And at this trial, there will be a judge, but no jury. There will be a prosecutor, but no defense. There will be a sentence, but no appeal. <laughs> you won't hear anybody say in the courtroom, what, what did uh, my, my man say? If, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. There will be none of that. Instead, you will only hear, if you don't know him, he must condemn. Uh, this is a tough teaching, but I think it's necessary for us to understand where we stand with God. The famous comedian W.C. Field was an agnostic all his life. Close to death, one of his friends came to visit him in the hospital. When he walked in the room, he was lying there reading his Bible. And his friend said to him, why? Why are you reading the Bible? Are you getting religion? W.C. Fields replied, no, no, I'm just looking for loopholes. <laughs> well, let me tell you, friend, in the day of judgment, there will be no loopholes. The ungodly will be convicted. They will be convicted of their ungodly words, the Bible says. He will convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds and of their ungodly ways, which they have committed in an ungodly way. And finally, they will be convicted of their ungodly words. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, in other words, the ungodly will be convicted in what they did, what they thought, and what they said. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Now, keep in mind that Jude was talking here about the apostate. 1 Peter 2.20. The apostate are those who knew his, his way, appeared to walk the right way, and then willingly turned around and went the wrong way. The Bible says the harshest judgment and the hottest part of hell is reserved for apostates. 1 Peter 2.20, quote, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter is worse than the former. In other words, their latter end is going to be worse than their beginning. He goes on to say, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and to turn from it. It is better to know the truth than to not know it. But if you know it and turn from it, the Bible says, your situation is going to be grievous. Right? And, and I might as well tell you. Because this is what the Bible says. One of the strangest stories I've ever read about a man named Robert Reachin uh, spent 12 years on death row. He asked a man by the name of Stubbs to loan him $400. Of course, the man refused. You're on death row, right? One month later, Breachin came to his house and shot his 59-year-old wife in the face with a rifle and then went looking for Mr. Stubbs, who had a revolver. Stubbs wounded Breachin in the shoulder, and the police followed the trail of his blood and caught him. And that's how he was sentenced to die. Uh, that part of the story is unfortunate, not very strange. But the rest of the story is, Breachin was supposed to be put to death by lethal injection at midnight. But at nine, the guards went to check on him, and he was breathing heavily. His pupils were dilated. He was almost unconscious. They rushed him to the hospital and discovered that somehow he had gotten uh, an overdose of sedatives, uh, evidently to commit suicide. Uh, when they could not revive him, they rushed him to the hospital, had his stomach pumped, and brought him out of a near coma back to life. But when he recovered, they brought him back to the prison, strapped him back in the gurney, and executed him. Now you say, why did they do that? Well, in 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the condemned, listen to me, has to be aware of his execution and he has 
to know why he's being executed. The ungodly are just like that man. They're going to die. And they may think that when they die, they will get a taste of eternal freedom. But they are going to be raised from the dead just so that they can face judgment with God. Hebrews 9, 27 says, quote, It is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. There are two appointments you will keep with God. One is your death, and the next one is your judgment. And that's why the second coming of Jesus is so vitally important. I heard a story of an old man who spent all his life shining shoes for a living. He had an old worn out Bible that he read all those years. He had shiny shoes. One day a customer walked in and saw him reading uh, his Bible. Revelation, he said, why do you read the book of Revelation? You can't understand it. The old shoe shiner said, you're wrong, sir. I know exactly what the book says. Customer said, you, you're an uneducated man. You think you know what the book of Revelation means, but in truth, you don't really. Ah. Uh, the old man said, yes, sir, I not only know what it means, I can tell you in five words what it means. What five words, he said. It means that Jesus is going to win. And so I tell you tonight that Jesus is going to win. When the emperor comes back, when the emperor strikes back, Jesus is going to split the clouds come in his majesty and splendor, glory and victory. And the question is to you, my friends, are you going to be on the winning side? Are you going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Or are you going to hear the opposite? Hey, man, I don't even know who you are. What are you doing here? I'd like to hear the former. I want to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord so much so that he really recognizes my, my deeds, my, my devotion to him, and that he says, come on into the joy of the Lord, my son. Come on in. That's all I have for you tonight. I hope I hope the Lord blesses you with it. I hope you uh, get a little something out of it to take with you into tomorrow. Um, I, I pray the Lord's blessing upon every word. I might have said something that encourages you. I, I sincerely hope uh, that you don't soon forget the word of the Lord. 